Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Cover 2 Podcast. I'm Jared Smith. And I'm Nick Nina. And uh, we are a little late in this week's episode, but fortunately, with the rain out yesterday of Game 4 of the ALCS, mm -hmm. that game is now moved to tonight, which gives us more of an opportunity to talk about that matchup. Uh, you know, will the extra day of rest help the Yankees or the Astros more, and who has the advantage going into this pivotal next game? But we're going to talk about that a little bit later on in the show. First off, uh, there was breaking news a couple days ago as the LA Rams traded for Pro Bowler Jalen Ramsey, Ooh. the probably arguably most talented cornerback in the NFL today. Uh, but they did give up a hefty price for him, two first round picks and a fourth round pick. Uh, so the Rams for the next few years will not have a first round pick, but that is actually nothing new to them as the Rams in the last five years have only had one first round pick. That was taken uh, for Jared Goff, who is their Pro Bowl starting number quarterback, one. number one. Yeah. Uh, so let's jump right into it, Nick. There's obviously a lot of uh, mixed reviews and a mixed bag as far as if the Rams gave up too much for Jalen Ramsey or if Jalen Ramsey is really worth two first round picks uh, and a fourth round pick. What is your opinion on this? Um, just the, the, the trade in itself and if this elevates the Rams to contenders for the playoffs. Well, I, I, I don't know if it, it, it elevates them to be Super Bowl contenders ne necessarily, but absolutely playoff contenders. I mean, they're three and three right now, but they have a somewhat easy schedule coming up, easier schedule than a lot of the other teams battling for wild card spots in the NFC. In, in fact, their schedule is so um, is so light that they actually still have a chance to even win the NFC West. Uh, if they can beat the Seahawks and if they can beat the 49ers in the next couple games. They'd have to do that. Of course, if you lose to the division leaders, you're going to eventually not win the division. That's just what happens. But the way their schedule's lined up, their next three games, they should absolutely win. They're against that. I believe, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think the teams have won two games, period, all season. The next, uh, yeah, you, next three games. You can I say might, they should win those games. I might be a little off on there. There might be three or four games won there. But still, it's nothing, it's nothing easy. It, it's nothing big. So they'll go six and three. They'll have their bye in the middle of that as well. So they essentially have a month to get prepared. Getting back to Jalen Ramsey, though, what he's going to do this, uh, to this team. You know, they, they traded Marcus Peters, which was shocking when they did that. But now it makes more sense. Since right. They got Jalen Ramsey the same day. The trade yeah. for Marcus Peters was before the Rams traded for Jalen Ramsey. And at first, it was very shocking because let's remember, uh, to begin this week, the Rams put their other star corner, Aqib Tlaib, on injured reserve. Actually, that was the same day, too. Which, mean, okay, this was day, yeah, which yeah, means yeah. that, you know, they were down one starting corner. And then you trade your other starting corner, and it's like, oh my gosh, this Rams defense has already been gashed <laughs> all year long, right? Clay Matthews has already been out for a few weeks. Uh, he has a broken jaw. So th this team is depleted on a, as a whole from a defensive standpoint. And now both of your starting corners are gone. And then it's exactly. like, oh my gosh, it all makes sense now no, because yes. we've got the star in Jalen Ramsey who is now in LA. No, 100%. And, and, and so you look at it and they needed a corner. Uh, they needed a DB. John Johnson III put on IR, so he really can only come back very late in the season playoff-wise. Yeah, he's gone it, for at least eight games. Exactly. So that, that's, a, you know, that's, a, that's a, big, uh, it's a big loss there too. So they're down three DBs. In one day, you gain one in Jalen Ramsey, you lose two first-round picks. I'll get on the two first-round picks in a second, but they needed Jalen Ramsey once they did all the stuff the, the, the day before. I get they need an offensive line. Uh, I get that they need uh, maybe some linebacker help after losing Clay Matthews. They maybe need some running back help with Malcolm Brown a little beat up, and of course Todd Gurley missing some games. Todd Gurley is just not the same um, as you think he is. You must be living under a rock to use one of Jared's uh, phrases right there because he's just not the same player and he's getting overpaid for what he's doing and it's unfortunate for the Rams. Ooh, yeah. But All right. you look at Jalen Ramsey. He's one of the best corners in the league. And a lot of times when you have one of the best corners with a collectively solid defense, your team is elevated. You can look at it in a lot of cases. Uh, Richard Sherman with the Seahawks. 
Now that was an all-time defense, but even when they were they started to lose some players, Richard Sherman still did help a lot out uh, because when you can take away one side of the field, everybody else's job is a little bit easier. We're going to see that more than likely with the Cardinals this week when they get Patrick Peterson back. Their defense has been atrocious. I watch every game. It's been one of the worst defenses to watch the last three years. They get Patrick Peterson back, I guarantee their defense will play better um, this week. But back to the Rams, once they get Jalen Ramsey, who I think is better than Marcus Peters, who I think is better than Akeem Believe, he's going to take away one side of the field. It's going to be easier for the whole defense. I've always said defense wins championships. You can lose your offensive line, but if you have a very solid defense, you still have a chance to at least make the playoffs. Not necessarily be a Super Bowl contender, but I think this is a good deal for this year. Now, Jared, I think we both agree on this as well. Tell the people what you think about them giving up two first-round picks. Not two first-round picks this year, first-round pick this, uh, this next coming draft, and a draft after that. So that's potentially you know, losing out on two great players. Right. Here, the, the Rams are basically saying we are going all in, uh, in in the next two to three years, right? They are looking to get back to the Super Bowl and win right now. Because when you give up multiple first round picks, you're basically saying that this is the team that we are going to roll with for the next few years. They've already given out big contracts to Jared Goff and Todd Gurley. Like you just mentioned, you don't feel that Todd Gurley has lived up to that contract as of yet. Uh, but the Rams, you know, and here's the thing. The Rams are used to not having a first round pick. They're just going to continue that trend for the next few years. And they are basically going to have to, uh, you know, get free agents in the off season and hope that their team stays healthy. The, the recipe for success, if you look at uh, you know, the last few Super Bowl contenders and the Philadelphia Eagles, and uh, let's, let's, let's look at a, a bigger sample size and the New England Patriots who for the last decade have just been completely dominant. What has this team done? Um, yes, here and there they go out and they get a big name. They, got ran, they traded for Randy Moss or they, uh, they acquired him for agency. Um, you know, this year they obviously acquired uh, um, uh, Antonio Brown for a hot minute, right? He had a cup of coffee for a week there in New England. But for the most part, the Patriots have been successful because they draft very well. And guess what? Because they have first round picks. And even though it may be later on in the draft or later on in the first round, uh, when it's basically a second round pick, because let's be honest, the first, you know, 15 or 16 or 17 picks are first round guys. And then when you start getting into the 20s and the 30s, you're really looking more towards second round guys anyway. Mm -hmm. um, because the Patriots have won Super Bowls, they have later picks. But what I'm trying to say is they still have a first round pick. And let's not remember, when you have a first round pick, you get a fifth year option on that player. So if he plays well, you not only you can, you can exercise the fifth year uh, and keep him on your team a little bit longer while you try to negotiate. The Rams will not have that opportunity to have a potential fifth round option on a player. So there, there's, you know, there's a multiple different ways that you can look at this. I'm looking at this in, in the negative light as I think that to build a team, you need to do it through the draft and not having first round picks only hurts you. So the Rams go out and they win a Super Bowl in the next year or two. You know what? We're going to look back and say, this was a great trade. Exactly. The Rams don't. I, it doesn't matter about them making it to the Super Bowl because we already know that they can make it there. They have to win. The Rams don't win a Super Bowl in the next two to three years. Then you know what? This trade didn't work out. Oh, 100%. No, yeah. But that's not what we're looking at this year. We're looking at, do they, have they increased their chances at winning a Super Bowl? I think they did because you can't do anything about Aqib Talib getting hurt. He was going to go on our and you lost Aqib Talib. Okay, uh, I, I believe he'll be out for the rest of the season too. He's done. Yeah, he's he, done. he won't be able to play. So you then your your only corner at that point is Marcus Peters. Really, your only good DB at that point is Marcus Peters. You trade him away because you know you're going to get Jalen Ramsey. You actually increase at that position at corner because I think Jalen Ramsey is a better player than Marcus Peters. Right now, uh, if he gets a little diva-ish like Marcus Peters did and like we've seen a lot of other guys, then he kind of turned into the same player. So hopefully he can keep his mind right and not turn into a diva like he did in Jacksonville. Uh, 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 Jalen Ramsey is already a diva. Well, did but, you not see him pull up the training camp in a Brinks money truck well, with a guy coming out with a microphone basically yelling, pay Jalen Ramsey? 
You're gonna tell me that's Which not didn't happen, diva, and now he's in LA. Yeah, you're gonna tell me that's like that's not diva-ish yeah. mentality right there. Well, no, no, no. I, I'm just saying he needs to not be that when he's on the ramp. I think he was he was he was doing that in Jacksonville because he wanted to get what he wanted to get. He actually ended up getting what he wanted to get. He did. So now he doesn't have to be diva. And now he's here in La La Land, and you expect him to be less of a diva in LA? No, I don't. I'm just saying he needs to not be that. Okay. That we, we need to get back on track. We need to get back to. Track. Long story short, the, the Rams actually got better after this trade. On defense. Did, did they get better? No, I think they got better, period. You, you, you got a better player. It, 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 the, the better the defense, the better the offense. The whole team You better. said it at the beginning of this show in your, in your opening statement. Yes. This, the, this trade for Jalen Ramsey does not fix the offensive line problems no, that the Rams yeah. have. It does not fix Todd Gurley's injury. And it does not fix Jared Goff. Playing like complete no, crap no, no, in the last no, couple that, weeks that, that, when he true. threw for less than 100 yards. No, no that was yeah. I mean, less that, than 100 <laughs> yards. And then this that, is an and NFL. Derek, though, they pass all the time too. Exactly. Isn't that crazy? Isn't that crazy? Exactly. No, so but, that does not fix the offensive issues no, 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 no. that this team is. You don't give up saying that. What I'm saying is, the better your defense. The better your offense. So you're saying that the defense complements the offense. It does because you're 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 you're, uh, you're giving your offense more chances by stopping them more. You're keeping your team in the game. Uh, you're allowing your team not to be backed up all the way into the five. You know what I'm saying? Like the five yard line all the time. It, it just it, it it's gonna it's gonna help everything, right? Two three years down the road, I don't know what this team's gonna be. They're gonna have Aaron Donald's contract down their back. They're gonna have Jared Goff, who you said threw 100 uh, less than 100 yards. Uh, you know, getting about hundred million a year, right? Um, you have Jalen Ramsey, who will get signed because you traded two first round picks for him. Now you have to sign Jalen Ramsey. Oh, that's so, that's happening. Exactly, and, and I'm probably forgetting about somebody over in Todd Gurley's contract as well. So, two three years from now, this team could be the worst team in the league. I know, but right now, this year, they got better as far as their playoff chances go, and with a easy month. Coming up to where Jalen Ramsey can just slowly get ready, used to the the, the defense. Well, they, they they said that they want to play him this Sunday. Well, they, well, they should because they need him. They uh, have no. Listen, else. they're going up against yeah. a Falcons team with Julio Jones, the best, arguably the best receiver in the league. It'd be nice to have arguably the best corner in the I'll league just, to match I'll, up I'll say this though: Julio Jones without Mike Shanahan, like everybody else in that Falcons team, is just not. It's good. It, 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 it's no Julio that, Jones talent wise is still great. No, it's the just, offensive the scheme. scheme is not getting him open enough. Uh, even against the Cardinals, it was not until way later in that game that he even got super involved. Right. So if the Cardinals defense is able to stop him, that's not can do. Like if Jalen Ramsey's on him, they're going to be fine. And the Fal- they'll beat the Falcons. The Falcons are going to end up firing Dan Quinn probably next couple weeks just because they're so bad. Right. But, um, what I'm saying about next the next the next month because of their buy in the three easy games, Jalen Ramsey can get used to the, the defense. They'll be winning games. They'll be six and three after this next month, and the offense will have a chance to get better because they're playing such bad defenses and get more confident. This Rams team is fine. Once we get, hopefully they don't lose a, a couple more players. Um, you know, and eventually they can get some of these offensive linemen back. Right? They didn't lose everybody for the rest of the season. Correct? I don't believe so. I think they're just dealing with injuries. No, exactly. So once the playoffs go, this team will be better. And by having Jalen Ramsey on your team, that gives you a chance at the Super Bowl. I'm not saying they're going to win the Super Bowl, but they, they will make the playoffs. I'll say this right now. The Rams will make the playoffs. Because they got Jalen Ramsey. All right, Jalen Ramsey right needs to be the next, the second coming of Deion Sanders. He needs to pick <laughs> off Sanders. balls. He needs to go. He needs to high step into the end zone, and he needs to score points on defense to help this offense. Because the last couple weeks, this offense has looked like a shell of itself. Even though they have uh, all three of their starting receivers, and you know the the only uh, you know person that they don't really have is Todd Gurley there. So Jalen Ramsey needs to not only uh, do well on defense as far as guarding the best receiver, he needs to get turnovers and really affect the game from a defensive standpoint. But we do need to move on. Let's transition into a former Ram now. Yes. And we did mention him uh, just a few minutes ago in Marcus Peters, who is was traded to the Baltimore Ravens. And this one, like we said, this was before the Jalen Ramsey trade. So I was kind of uh, scratching my head in why the Rams would trade their starting cornerback. And let's think about this for a minute. Uh, Marcus Peters, who is still on his rookie contract in his fourth season in the NFL, was drafted by Kansas City and in the first two years in the league led the NFL in interceptions, right? 
He has had some off-field issues going back to his days at the University of Washington and coming into the league. Some teams are a little skeptical in drafting him, but the Kansas City Chiefs took a chance on him and obviously that paid off. But guess what? They then in turn traded him to the Rams, right? The Rams obviously had him. Uh, he had some ups and downs with that team, helped that team get to the Super Bowl, but ultimately in the end, they did lose to the Patriots last year. And now he is on his third team in four seasons. Listen, we know that this kid, Marcus Peters, has talent, but you don't get traded three times in four years for no reason. So why do you think that Marcus Peters has not been able to find a steady home and he is constantly being traded? Because he's a, I, he's a good player, uh, possibly a great player, uh, that has an attitude. And look at Antonio Brown right now. Now, I know there's a lot of different issues with Antonio Brown. Antonio Brown's arguably the best wide receiver in the game and a top 10 player in this league. He is now sitting at home, not playing in the league because of his attitude. Marcus Peters, we've seen a lot happen with him. We've seen him fight guys. We've seen him go in the stands, literally, and argue with fans during the during late in the season. Was it during the playoffs? It was during the playoffs. During, during the playoffs. playoffs. Okay, so that's why this guy has been traded three times. And, and, and you know, it, what's funny about this, too, is he got traded, you know, like you, you mentioned, you got, we got, the Rams traded a diva for another potential diva. So, like, this guy is that bad? In the lo- I, I don't know. I don't know. They didn't say anything about, you know, him being a bad locker room guy, but I don't know. And also combining him with guys like Dom Kinsu and the Keith Khalid is probably not the best idea for a defense. Some rough riders. You know, exactly. Some guys that are not the best influences as well. But I just think, you know, it's his attitude, 100%. It's not his play. And I think the Ravens are getting a great player. And much like Jalen Ramsey, if Marcus Peters can calm it down a bit, the Ravens are really getting a great player. And it's going to help them. Like I just said with Jalen Ramsey, make the playoffs because they'll make the playoffs but potentially be Super Bowl contenders. Now, I'll say this right now. I said this on Twitter uh, on Sunday. Uh, a lot of us watched the Kansas City Chiefs and Houston Texans this weekend. Mm-hmm. Great, Great game. game. Uh, Texans pulled it out in surprising fashion and Mahomes loses the second game in a row at home. Okay, big deal. You know why that's happening? Because those two defenses are not good. The Chiefs, one of the worst in the league, Okay. It, it's, a, it's a miracle their offense is good because they would be a losing team right now if okay. their offense wasn't good. They'd be one of the worst teams in the league. Uh, the Texans, you know, if they had an offensive line, they'd be a great team. But uh, their defense is not as good as well. The Ravens making this move puts them on par with the Patriots as having one of the best defenses in the AFC. And in my opinion, if Lamar Jackson can run the way he's been doing and can make the clutch passes... It's going to be Ravens Patriots in, in the AFC Championship because of the defense. I always, I always will say, a great quarterback number one, and a uh, in, a great defense will win you a Super Bowl. And right now, the Ravens and Patriots have great defenses. One of them has the best quarterback of all time, and Lamar Jackson showing himself to be um, better than a lot of people expected. You can have Deshaun Watson, you can have Patrick Mahomes, but if your defense can't stop anybody, you will lose two straight games at home like Kansas City did, which is unprecedented, right? So I just think with, with this move, and after losing Tony Jefferson as well, who is a very, very solid safety, it helps their DB core, and I think the Ravens, a lot like the Rams, they're actually in a better position than the Rams, but a lot like the Rams, have now made themselves way more of a contender than they are anymore. That was a very nice, drawn out, uh, well was. thought explanation yes. uh, and answer. I drew that. a lot when I said about yeah. that. Yeah, um, <laughs> this is actually going to be very simple. Um, this, to me, has nothing to do with Marcus Peters and his attitude because you can you you compare it to Are you Antonio Brown. Are three times? Yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. This doesn't have to do with his attitude at all. This has to do with his skill on the football field. Ooh. Let me tell you why. You just brought up the comparison to Antonio Brown. Antonio Brown was purposely doing things not only off the field during a game, but off the field uh, in the locker room, getting into an argument with the general manager, calling him uh, explicit names, all that stuff. Marcus Peters, yeah, he is arguing with fans and he, you know, he's a little feisty on the field. Guess what? When you're a star player or when you have talent, teams will put up with your antics on the field. The reason why Marcus Peters has moved on to his third team in four years is because he is a gambler at corner. I compare him to Asante Samuel, 
who formerly was in the NFL, played with the Philadelphia Eagles and with the New England Patriots. He is a player that likes to gamble and jump plays, right? He wants to make the big interception and return it to the house for a touchdown. That is how Marcus Peters plays. Guess what? You can gamble and sometimes win, but the majority of the time you're going to lose. Teams will run double moves on you and you will give up touchdowns just like Marcus Peters has done time and time again. He is not a technique sound player. If you go back and watch the tape on him, you can see that he, he doesn't move his feet well. Um, he kind of just, he, he gets very lackadaisical in his fundamentals. And you know, he's a good athlete, but he's not a Deion Sanders type athlete where you can make up for the lack of fundamentals. So to me, this doesn't really have much to do with his attitude and, and all that off the field stuff. Because like I said, when you're talented, you can deal with that. Antonio Brown is in a whole nother stratosphere. And he, in my opinion, does not compare to Marcus Peters in that sense. Marcus Peters is gone from the Rams because he was not technically sound and he gave up too many touchdowns. So from a defensive standpoint, you keep giving up touchdowns, you're going to get benched and eventually cut. In this case, because Marcus Peters has value, he got traded. So I think it, is, it comes down to, uh, to being that simple. He just is not technically sound. So for the Ravens, this is, we, they know that they got a talented corner. It's about them now harnessing Marcus Peters' skill set breaking down his fundamentals and making sure that he is fundamentally sound on every single play. If he does that, yes, maybe he doesn't get the amount of interceptions from a, from a statistical standpoint, but I guarantee you he won't give up as many big chunk plays and as many touchdowns, and therefore that will better off help the Ravens' defense. Here's the other thing, too. A lot of people don't know this. So they have Marlon Humphrey, who's turned into a great corner. He's a great corner, league. yes. Uh, they obviously have Marcus Peters. You have Earl Thomas. Uh, in the back, right. securing everything. Jimmy Smith is close to coming back this season. Right. So Marcus Peters and the rest of this cornerback crew is going to have less to do on the field because there's so much talent at DB now on this team. So Marcus Peters is being put in a position where he doesn't have to be the number one guy. Maybe you can move him to the slot for a bit. You can move Jimmy Smith to the slot. You can move Marley. Like, like, so there's a lot right. they can right. do. There's they a lot have, of versatility. They ha now have three legitimate starting corners they're going to be playing on the field all the time. And like I said, they missed the, the, they're missing a strong safety. Their strong safety right now is Chuck Clark. I've never even heard of that dude before. Okay, so they now supplanted themselves, uh, or they got rid of the fact that they lost their strong safety mm -hmm. and now uh, helped themselves in the best way possible. So that's why they... So what is your opinion of the Ravens? Do you think this helps them? It does. Yeah. It does. And the Ravens are already a great defense without Marcus Peters. Like I said, if Marcus Peters can play fundamentally sound, right, and kind of put himself in check and say, I don't need to make the big play and gamble all the time. I can just focus on my fundamentals. Then, yes, I think that Marcus Peters will be an asset to this team. If he continues the way that, to, to play the way that he did with L.A. and with Kansas City, then he will make some good plays. But unfortunately, I think he will make more bad plays than good. And his time with Baltimore will not be long either. So it, it, this is on Marcus Peters, in my opinion, and how he wants to uh, better evolve his game. Very Absolutely. simple as that. We do need to move on, though, uh, and switch topics to Major League Baseball. And before we get into uh, the Washington Nationals advancing to the World Series and the big game tonight between the Astros and the Yankees, we want to talk about the hometown Los Angeles Angels who have brought back uh, Joe Madden as their now manager who was with the organization for over 30 years before he got his first managerial job uh, with the Tampa Bay Rays. Tampa Bay, yeah. uh, let's let's talk about this. We you are a big baseball fan, Nick. Um, yeah. Obviously, more of a Dodgers fan than Angels fan. But um, you know, is this was this the right move for the Angels? And with all the scrutiny going on, as the DEA is now investigating this Angels organization mm -hmm. after the death of Tyler Skaggs. Uh, how do you feel that Joe Madden fits in with this team? I, I mean, I think, I mean, how could he not fit in? He was with the, he was with the franchise for 30 years prior to this. I don't right, but that was over 10. I mean, that was a while ago. That's true. Times have changed. That's true. And, and, and it was under Mike's social staff that had a lot of um, future MLB coaches on it as well. So maybe it was a culture thing. I don't know. Joe Madden, though, his record speaks for himself. He brought a Rays team that was one of the worst franchises in baseball pretty much since their inception to the World Series with a roster that if you go look back now, you wonder, man, how the hell did that team get to the world? Exa exactly. So uh, he did that. He literally ended the curse of the Billy Goat in Chicago by beating the Cleveland Indians in Game 7 in 2016. Yep. 
so this guy's record speaks for itself. He was also the first manager ever, which is an amazing stat. Listen to this one. To uh, have the Cubs make five consecutive playoff appearances. Uh, wow. Two before they wow. didn't make the playoffs this year. So That's this amazing. man is one of the best coaches in baseball. Maybe one of the best coaches in baseball history. And the Angels just picked him up. So not only was is he familiar with the organization, you know, I, I heard a, a phone call he took with the local radio station here yesterday, and he, he was making all the mentions to the local areas, the spring training field. He knows this place. Right, so, right. This but, is like coming home. Exactly. So the familiarity for him will be fine. And the Angels roster is still, you know, it's still very talented. It's still a middle of the – well, listen to this. I'm going to say a work in progress. It's, but... it's, it's a work in progress, but they have the best baseball player on earth on the team. Their starting lineup uh, – is, is is a very very solid starting lineup. I would say above, hey, above lineup, that, not yes. pitching. Okay, okay. Oh, I just want to, to, to make sure we're clarifying that. Yeah. Okay, but uh, their defense is phenomenal as well. And what then the problem is the pitching. And I think if they can get a a, a number one dude, you get uh, Shohei Otani back. Um, I think some of these young dudes have potential for the Angels. It's not going to be a great pitching staff, but it will be serviceable enough. And when you have a guy like Joe Madden that's innovative. Really, really studies analytics. Will mess around with the starting lineups and, uh, a bit and stuff like that. And I, I'm sure will not be afraid to use the opener and other stuff like that. I think this is the right guy for the Angels' job and a team that's around 500 every year. This is the kind of coach that can get them into the 90 win. Category. Before we move on to, to Tyler Skaggs yeah. and that and that whole ordeal, uh, you, you mentioned you know having the Angels potentially bring in an ace, uh, yeah. Garrett Cole, for example, who will be a free agent after the season is over. Does Joe Madden have that type of personality, and uh, is he the type of guy that can bring on, or you know, just say, "Hey, listen, I, we need you over here." Can he bring those type of star players? Does he have enough uh, in himself? Because the Angels organization as a whole is not necessarily attracting these players like uh, the Dodgers or the Yankees or these other no, big teams. Point. Does Joe point. Madden have enough savvy to himself? bring on his talented players. I think he does. And I, I, I point to the Cubs getting John Lester from the Boston Red Sox. Because the Boston Red Sox, obviously, are one of the most famous, most popular Story teams in the league. People want to go play at Fenway. They want to live in the city of Boston. And so you, you look at Lester leaving Boston to go play for a Cubs team that had not won a World Series in 100-plus years. I think right there, that shows that Joe Madden can get a guy like Madison Bumgarner, get a guy like Garrett Cole. And Garrett Cole is literally from five minutes away. He's from, he's from Newport Beach. So he's, you know, he grew up a Yankee All fan, right. which okay. is a little weird because I don't know why you're from Orange County, you're a Yankee fan, and we, we know people that are like that. It's <clears throat> unfortunate. But, it's okay. but it, it, so that's, it, you know, it, it's, you look at it right now and you go, this guy's from Orange County. He went to UCLA. He went to Orange Lutheran High School, which is right up the street. Um, Joe Madden's a local guy. He's been with the Angels for, like you said, over 30 years. He's been in the area. He's been in Anaheim. This is a no-brainer for Garrett Cole if they put the money on the table. Connect. And the Astros don't pay him the same money. Did the, the, the Angels have the money to go out and do this? I mean, they, they, I, they I think it's space? at the point right now, to be honest. I know a lot, do teams don't want, exactly. a lot of teams don't want to do this. I mean, look at the Dodgers, for example. They actually stayed under the luxury tax this year, which is crazy of how good their roster is. But... A lot of teams don't want to do it. I think it's time for the Angels and Artie Marino. Hey, if we want Look to have, yeah, we, we, we need this guy. Garrett Cole's the best pitcher in baseball right now. Look at the way he's been. His last, I think it's his last 26 games, including the playoffs, he's 19 and 0. Wow. And his ERA is in the ones. Okay, that's the best pitcher in baseball right best now. Best pitcher in baseball, best player in baseball, and Mike Trout. Sounds like a good combination to me. And one of the best coaches in baseball, too. All right. Yeah. Now, with it, with all that being yes, said, yes, there's yes, obviously yes. the huge uh, controversy going around, obviously. And this Tyler's, could deter all of this. Right, exactly. Yeah. With Tyler Skaggs, uh, you, know, you know, dying earlier this year uh -huh. uh, in Texas when they were playing the Texas Rangers, the, uh, the, the DEA is now involved, obviously, and they are doing their own investigation as well as the Major League, Major League Baseball is doing their own separate investigation. But with all that being said, uh, what is what is going on with this team right now? How does Joe Madden come in and you know, like I don't even know how you begin to. Does Joe Madden just have to take a step back and let due process play itself out? 
Uh, how does he kind of rally the troops? There are so many you know, little things going on. Employees uh, within this organization are being said to have uh, given Tyler Skaggs these drugs. Mm -hmm. um, th there's a potential huge fallout with all of this. Yes. How does this all play out? Uh, yeah, now I've done a lot of research on this just because it's the local team and it's just, it's so interesting because this stuff doesn't happen in sports a lot where you have these major FBI investigations and these DEA investigations. We see this more in politics and stuff like that. So to see it join the sports world with a team that is 20 minutes away from my house, it's very, very interesting. Um, so far we have an Angels employee that has come out who is currently right now in rehab say that he has supplied Tyler Skaggs with drugs. This is on the record. Go look up the LA Times. Go look up uh, Outside the Lines. Uh, I'm not making this up. Um, and he has said that there is there are people that knew about uh, the drug use of Tyler Skaggs. Tyler Skaggs was addicted to opioids, it seems like, which is unfortunate. And a lot of Americans are, are addicted to opioids, unfortunately, just because of the way the drug culture is um, here in the U.S. And so Tyler Skaggs is one of them. And uh, this man has come out and said that he supplied him, was an Angels employee. He said other Angels employees uh, knew. That's a major no-no in the MLB. You're supposed to report all of these things. If you even think a player, you're supposed to essentially, you, you rat if a guy you believe is you know, taking steroids. Any taking type steroids. of substance abuse. 100%. Or right. any banned substance Exa uh, from Major League Baseball. Exactly. Supposed to be reported. There, there's reportedly uh, former and current players, according to this same man, that were uh, have also used opo opioids in the past. Not necessarily saying they're addicts, but saying that they've used them. Um, there's, been a cut, there's been four Angel players that have been interviewed so far uh, from the DEA. Not saying that any of these guys did any of this. But, uh, well, actually, there's been six interviewed. Only four players have been disclosed. I'm not going to say the four players. You can look it up yourself but, and, and make your own judgments. But, yeah, this is a not – this is a obviously horrible situation. And uh, for the man that has been giving away this information, he's risking himself to get sued and all this stuff. Uh, I, I don't believe he's at risk of getting going to prison over this because there's no way – with the combination of drugs and alcohol that you can determine that opioids were the thing that killed Tyler Skaggs. It was in his system, so it probably had something to do with it, but there's no way you can say that uh, the, the man that gave him these drugs is is at risk of, uh, or is that, well, I'm trying to find the words for it, is caused the fault. death. At fault, exactly. At fault of the, uh, for the death of Tyler Skaggs. But like you mentioned, Joe Madden is coming into this you know, the Angels organization has to deal with this in the offseason and, and with free agents because if there's going to be sanctions, if there's going to be guys suspended, if there's going to be guys, um, if the team's going to be fined a lot, this is a big thing. And like you mentioned, I think Joe Madden is absolutely expunged. Get, get away from this. Be, be a coach. Do everything you possibly can besides get involved in this. Because obviously Joe Madden has nothing to do with this. He was with the Chicago Cubs. He is not a, 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 you know, he was not the head coach last year where he might have seen any of this. So he needs to take a step back. And I think any Angels players that aren't interviewed by the DEA also need to leave this alone and just let due process go and let them figure this out. You know, we're not going to bring Tyler Skaggs back, unfortunately. But if there's people at fault and there's people in the organization that need to get in trouble for this, hopefully it happens. Because obviously we don't want players or any human being dying because of uh, negligence uh, of certain other human beings. So unfortunately, it's a terrible situation. I want to get your thoughts on it. I know you want me to give you a little rundown on what's happened exactly. so far. Just because you've been, you've been very busy in your personal life. So what do you think about this? What is your opinion of this whole angel situation? And what do you think Joe Madden should do? Um, it's disappointing. And it's sad to uh, hear that there were employees within the organization that were supplying Tyler Skaggs and potentially other current and former players with these drugs. And obviously, Major League Baseball has a zero tolerance policy with drugs, just like uh, you know the NFL and the NBA and, and the NHL do as well. And if, like you mentioned, if for any reason a player or an employee within the organization uh, feels that a, you know anyone is using these drugs, they have to go and report it. And the big no-no in all of this was that nothing was reported and the only reason that we know about this is because Tyler Skaggs died. 
hundred percent. Right. Yeah. So uh, if if he, Tyler Skaggs did not die and he was still here today, we more than likely would not know about any of these drug abuses or any of the this this oil pool. Well, think think about this too. Uh, we've we've come out and heard this is not just a baseball thing. It's it. it I'm, I'm not saying marijuana is equal to opioids, but we've heard a lot of stories from now former NFL players that they were high before every single game. Nobody knew that. They weren't drug tested. They weren't getting these suspensions. Calvin Johnson being the best example. I don't remember Calvin Johnson ever being suspended for smoking marijuana before a game where we've seen Josh Gordon get suspended seven times or whatever he's been sent. So you're right. It takes um, either a player retiring and reveal revealing it later or something horrible like this to happen things can be covered up. And with these guys potentially covering this up in the Angels organization, or at least revealing that they're, they, they didn't know even though they did, that is not a good thing, and that kind of culture needs to change in all of sports. Exactly, honest. and I think this Angels organization, uh, to wrap this up, is walking on very thin ice right now. Obviously, Joe Madden is the one person, uh, the, the newest member of this organization who has nothing to do with this. Not to say that other uh, players or employees do, but uh, you know they need to step aside, let due process figure stuff out. If the Angels do get fined, if they lose draft picks, whatever the case is, if they are found guilty and they were, you know, then it comes out true that they, they, that players and employees were involved in this, then yes, they do need to be charged uh, criminally or whatever the case may be. So uh, it is very unfortunate, um, but uh, you know, because a player did die, this goes from just you know, guys taking drugs and abusing drugs and being athletes to uh, a person, not an athlete. This has nothing to do with the sport. A person died mm -hmm. potentially because of drugs. And that cannot happen uh, in any circumstance, whether you are a, uh, you know, an average Joe and a regular everyday human being, or you are a major league baseball player. It cannot happen. 100%. Tyler Scott is someone that can afford that type of thing too, which is unfortunate that he was just able to keep doing it, keep doing it, which I, I think almost makes it worse, the fact that he was just able to freely do this whenever he wanted and all that stuff. Exactly, so uh, let's move on to our final topic of the show. We are going to continue talking baseball, uh, uh, but we are talking about the postseason. Oh yeah. The Washington Nationals swept the St. Louis Cardinals Ooh. and they are moving on to the World Series, awaiting the uh, series between the Astros and the Yankees. Let's quickly talk about the Nationals and then get into the other series currently going on. Nick, uh, the Nationals first come here and beat the Dodgers, right, after the Dodgers were heavy favorites. You don't mind me. I'm sorry, I just, I, I have to let our viewers know <laughs> how the Nationals got to yeah, where they, they are. Did. Yeah. And then they unexpectedly sweep the St. Louis Cardinals. The Nationals are hot right now. They are on a roll. Uh, you can tell that this team has a lot of camaraderie. They are a very close-knit group of guys, and maybe they don't have the most talent. They don't have as much talent as the Dodgers do. Maybe they don't have as much talent as the, the uh, New York Yankees or the Houston Astros, but this team is playing united. They are playing together, and when you have a strong-knit group that has confidence and that's playing together, that is, uh, that's a very dangerous team to go up against. So uh, I want to get your thoughts on yeah. the Nationals and what you think of them sweeping the Cardinals to get to the yeah, World Yeah, we'll, we'll just do this quick because we're going to do a World Series prediction, so we'll get more in-depth about the team and all that stuff. But just about them sweeping, it's crazy because in a matter of a week, they defeated the Dodgers in Game 5 in spectacular comeback fashion and then are moving on to the World Series. Like, it, 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 it's crazy. I was making a joke to my brother because I, I, uh, I, of course, you, most of you may know this. I, I do a, I follow pro wrestling a bit, and there is a, there's a new show on Wednesdays that's come out, and the Nationals beat the Dodgers and were headed to the World Series before that show uh, um, ran the next week. It was crazy. It was like, it, they already are going to the World Series? Like, I remember yelling at my TV, like, less than a week ago. It was like... It's just crazy how baseball works sometimes where a team that literally nobody thought would even probably beat the Dodgers in a series are now going, in a, going to the World Series in, in, in less than a week. It, it is just crazy to me. The thing about this team, though, like you said, it's a very team atmosphere. At one point, uh, I think there were 12 games under 500. Yeah, around the All-Star yeah, break. Yeah, it's just insane. Everybody had written them off. Uh, and now they're going to the World Series uh, to face the Yankees or the Astros, which is just, you know, 
you look at that series and, and to predict it a little bit, oh my goodness, if we get a Astros Nationals pitching rotation World Series, that might be one of the best like pitching World Series I've ever seen. And, and so a- you have Scherzer, Strasburg, Corbin, Garrett Cole, uh, Justin, Justin Berlander, Zach Greinke, you know, the bullpens as well. It's just, it'd be unbelievable. And then you, you, know, you have the Nationals potentially playing the Yankees as well, who have one of the best lineups in baseball and a very good rotation themselves. So it's going to be great. The Nationals have eight days off now, which is crazy and could hurt the momentum a little bit. But they also have the benefit of literally setting their rotation however they want. Well, listen, the Yankees had multiple days off before they started their series with the Astros. And we've seen now the Yankees are now down in that series. So uh, it is great to have rest. But sometimes when you're in a rhythm, it's almost better to just continue and keep playing. Last point before we get on to that series. uh, How do we think Bryce Harper's feeling right about now? (laughs) Uh, You know, Bryce Harper, obviously, for those who don't know, who are living under a rock, uh, left yes. the Washington Nationals <laughs> and signed one of the biggest contracts in Major League Baseball history with the Philadelphia Phillies. And, uh, you know, funny enough, when he was in his opening press conference with the Phillies, he happened to say that uh, DC is bringing or is going to have a championship. Or I, I don't quote me on that, but he basically mentioned the Nationals when he really meant the Phillies. So, uh, how, how do you, how do we think? He spoke into existence. Yeah, how do we think that Bryce Harper's feeling right now when that team, who many expected to go to the postseason, never made it to the postseason and has been sitting at home for the last couple weeks? Yeah. And now his former team is headed of the World Series. I mean, if, if Bryce Harper's a money guy, he's not necessarily that angry because he has financial security for about 13 years. <clears> it seems like he is. Yeah, but. I mean, if the baseball player in him has got to be like, I really hope they lose. I really hope the Astros and Yankees, you know, wow. uh, beat Just... them down the World Series. That's how I would feel, yeah. you know. Uh, it, it's it's a uh, it's unfortunate for Bryce Harper, but you know, maybe you look at it and the 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 releasing of Bryce Harper now has created this put this star in Juan Soto. It's released a potential better player. In Juan Soto to play every single day. We saw this with, with Cody Bellinger and the Dodgers. Right, where right. he was able to play every single day and he literally turned into the MVP. I think Juan Soto is going to win an MVP one of these years. And it's because even at the age of 20, he's able to play every day and get these valuable experiences. We've seen him with huge hits and home runs um, in his playoffs so far. He had the hit in the wild card game to literally uh, send the Nationals to the postseason. He had the uh, a big home run in game two against the Dodgers. They gave the Nationals the early lead in the first inning, and of course the big home run to tie the game off Clayton Kershaw as well. And he's still, you know, he's messing with the pitchers. He's got a personality. I really like that dude. And without with Bryce Harper on the team, you weren't able to fully see all of this and see the potential. So I think that's the main thing you get from Bryce Harper. But as far as Bryce Harper's feeling, hey man, you were the one that wanted the thirty million dollars, and you were the one that wanted to to get paid and, and have financial security. So you can't complain too Sometimes much. it's not always about the money. Yes. Now let's exactly. move on to the Astros and the Yankees to finish off uh, this show today. It is a very, very uh, pivotal game Ooh, tonight. Oh my God. Uh, uh, if, if this game were have been played yesterday, for those of you who are watching live uh, Thursday, the game was supposed to be played on Wednesday. And I think this really benefits the Yankees because the Yankees were going to basically have to play a bullpen game. Uh, A lot of their starters would not have been on normal rest. And I don't think the Yankees would have been comfortable with throwing out their starting pitchers on short rest. So the Yankees get an extra day and now they can go in with a more fully loaded roster. Uh, The Yankees are still down in this series though. How do you see tonight's game playing out? Well... I, we should do this. We should do this series based on what we think is going to happen, just because. Okay. By the time the podcast Let's comes out, it's it. The people are going to know what's going to happen. Let's do that. I'm going to analyze this whole thing. I'm going to give you the reason why I think the New York Yankees are going to win this series. Ooh. Because did you talk to Alex Silva? I, I talked not, to him yesterday. I, did, I actually still, have not talked to him about any of this. He's still very confident in his oh, team. Of course he is. All right. right. I'm just saying. I mean, here's the thing. I and this actually has nothing to do with the fact that I did say the Yankees were going to make the World Series initially. Uh, once the playoffs started, the Houston Astros did look like the best team. Now that the way the series has gone, this rain delay and this postponement of this Game 4 is so big for the Yankees because who are they facing tonight? Zach Greinke. 
Zach Greinke has been one of the worst pitchers in the playoffs so far, to be honest. And, and it's hard to argue that because he has had two games to pitch in this playoffs, and both of them have ended up in major losses. Okay? So you have Zach Greinke going for the Astros. They're up 2-1. They're in New York, right? Already not good for Zach Greinke. But what, what would have helped him out was the fact that he was going to face a bunch of relievers, and he wasn't going to be facing a true starter. That was going to give Zach Greinke the advantage to pitch well in Game 3. Not saying that they were going to win, mm -hmm. or Game 4, excuse me. But that gave the Astros the major advantage. Now that Masahiro Tanaka is going to be facing uh, Zach Greinke, i got to go with the Yankees to that. Right? i got to go with the Yankees in Game 4 now. Masahiro Tanaka is a better pitcher than Zach Greinke right now. So I'm going to go with the Yankees. You look at the next game. You know, Justin Verlander versus James Paxton. I, again, I don't know what's going to happen in that game, but it's more about looking for it further. What has now happened to the Astros, because of the fact that they're going to play four games in a row, the Astros' Game 7 starter is more than likely going to be Zach Greinke or somebody else. Because Garrett Cole and Justin Verlander are now not going to have enough time to come back for Game 7. Garrett Cole's probably going to pitch Game 6. Okay. A couple things to yeah. say. Uh, I was looking at Buster Only of ESPN mm -hmm. yesterday, and he threw out an idea. He said, the, obviously tonight, uh, Greinke is, is going for the yes. Astros, but for Game 5, that the Astros do what the Yankees were supposed to do yesterday, and the Astros go with a bullpen That's, type no, of no, game. No, no, I completely agree with that because and of the way this game is And they're yeah. pitching so that if it does get to a Game 7, they don't have to go with The game. rain delay has screwed up Justin Verlander's start because he would have started uh, and he would have had an extra day off to pitch Game 7. He's now only going to have one day off uh, after he pitches Game 5. If they do indeed start him, they've announced him as the starter. I don't know what the ramifications are of that if they change it, but... Now that he's announced for the starter on Friday, that means he will only have one day off Saturday and then would have to pitch on one day's rest. We know Justin Verlander is not good on short rest, okay? <laughs> Ask the race. Exactly. So this has put the Houston Astros at a disadvantage. So the New York home field advantage, which includes the weather, has now put it in gear for the Yankees. So I agree with Buster only. If they pitch Justin Verlander game five, they can kiss his hitters goodbye. Because they're going to have Garrett Cole in one of the games, but I don't think they're going to be able to win Game 6 and Game 7. I think they're going to lose one of those games. And then I think, you know, Game 7, anything can happen. And the Yankees have a good enough bullpen to where it doesn't matter who they start in Game 7. They have good enough guys. So that's why I'm saying the Yankees are going uh, to... My prediction is the Yankees are going to win this in 7, somehow. But because of the rain delay, the, the, the Astros rotation got screwed up. Okay, so this question now that I'm asking you is kind of null and void because you think the Yankees are going to win in 7. Is tonight's game a must win for the Yankees? Oh, because let's say the Yankees yeah, let's yeah, say yeah. the Yankees lose this game and the Astros win and they go so, up three one. The Astros win. Even though game five is still in New York because the Yankees are getting three home games in a row. Yeah. Is this a must win? But for the at Yankees that tonight? point, you you go all in if you're the Astros because you have Justin Verlander pitching. You know he's gonna give you six, seven innings or whatever. You can essentially pitch anybody you want and you go, we're up three just, one. I know we ha I know we have a day off, but we need to go for it. I Justin Verlander in a three one series lead, that is completely different than Justin Verlander in a um, in a two two series. It is a much more. I still think the Astros win Game Five regardless. I'll just say that right now. Okay. I just think because of Verlander not being able to to fully be prepared now right. for Game Seven, that is the disadvantage, and I think that's where. Um, you're going to see these bullpen guys for the Astros get tired. And even if Garrett Cole does go seven innings, oh man, those last two innings are going to be scat she for, uh, for, uh, for the Houston Astros. So that's why I got the Yankees and said, what's your prediction? Here? What do you think happens? I, I, you know, I'm saying, uh, I, I, I'm picking the Astros to win this series. I just don't know if they're going to, I think they're going to close it out. But I, I think the Astros have it. So you think the Astros win tonight? Yeah. Yeah, I think the Astros win you're, tonight. You're relying on Zach Greinke. You're going with Zach Greinke. Yeah, I, I am, man. I am. Listen, listen. I understand that with this rain delay, this really helps the New York Yankees with their pitching and getting a starting pitcher back in rotation. I I love their hitting, man. I really do. They have clutch hitting. They've got hitting from one through nine. And I understand. Uh, you know, you can use the analogy that like pitching in baseball is like uh, defense in the NFL. Defense wins championships. Therefore, pitching, you know, wins championships, wins the World Series in baseball. I understand that. 
the, the Astros hitting man is just nuts. I'll say something. About I'm just yeah. I, I I don't know. It's tough for me to go against that right now, and I'm not trying to disregard the Yankees pitching at all because I understand how great they are. I just think that the Astros are the the better complete team, and they're on a roll. And the way they're hitting right now, I just I can't go against the Astros. It's the the one thing is the the Yankees won Game One seven nothing. Now there's there's rumors now that saying that they were stealing signs, all this stuff. Game One, whatever. Teams That's steal not, signs all the time. Exactly. A hundred percent. I completely agree with that. If you think that teams don't cheat a little bit in every single sport and try to get an advantage, it's ridiculous. You know, even when you're you playing, ain't cheating, you ain't trying. A hundred percent. Exactly. So. You look at that, and it, against Grinky, they they've seen him before, and they already beat him up. That's why I think they're winning tonight. Okay. Um, and then you have obviously a Verlander game five, and then I I think the Yankees will just win the next two games just due to the Astros bullpen not being as good and their arms getting wasted and stuff like that. Um, I'm forgetting my point right now, so I'm gonna toss it to you again. <laughs> and while I think of my point, um, you're saying the Yankees in five. The Astros. Excuse me. Yeah, you're saying Astros. But, oh, you know, I was going to say, the thing about their hitting, and I told this to the people I was watching the game with, uh, I believe it was game three. There is no, like, with the Astros, it doesn't matter if they're home or they're away, they, 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 their hitters are not faced. That's why I like them. They're, I know. That's why I like but them. But I just think pitching is the thing that will end up screwing you over. And if, you know, you can, you can hit six home runs in the game, and if your pitcher gives up seven home runs... Or seven runs? Listen, it's over. For, the sake, for the sake of being yeah. a baseball fan, I would love to see this go seven, huh? right? Uh, it, it, the, the Washington Nat or Nationals want this to go 20, right? <laughs> they want all the rest in the world, right? Uh, so for the sake of being a fan, yes, I would like to see this series extended and go back to Houston for a potential sixth and seventh game. I just, like I said, I, it's very tough to go against the Houston Astros with the amount of talent and just the, the well-rounded team that they are. We've seen what they've done already. We know that they can win in New York. Yes, they have Grinky going tonight, but if Grinky can just be good enough and this Astros team gets like five runs, I think five runs is the benchmark. The Astros get five runs and Grinky goes six innings. I think tonight's... I yeah, think I'll, say, I'll say this. If Tanaka, you know, does what Severino did in the first inning and gives, throws 30 pitches and these guys are hitting all over the ballpark before... Before the Astros even, or before the Yankees even get to hit against Grinky, then you could see the momentum switch. Baseball is a momentum game. I saw it so many times in the Dodgers series. Um, for some reason, the Cardinals could never get any advantage um, uh, or any momentum in that National Series. Uh, but that's you know that's a big thing too. If the Astros can get to Tanaka in Game Four early in the first inning specifically, then it changes it because. If you're down two runs, it changes the first thing. But I'm telling you, man, Tanaka goes one, two, three, and, and the, oh, they're, they're going to be, you know, the, the barbecue chicken, like Shaq would barbecue say. Barbecue chicken. I get, I get Zach Grinky. Oh, man, Aaron Judge is going to be swinging for the fences. Brett Gardner is going to be sprinting down the first base. It's going to be interesting. Regardless, though, these next two games, no right. matter what, whether the Astros win in five or, or the, the series moves on to Houston and the series is 3-2, is, is it's going to be very interesting. It's going to be fun baseball. Yeah, uh, those were a lot of ifs that we just threw out there, a lot of potentials and what if goes on. Uh, what is not an if? What we do know for certain is that tonight's game is a must win for the Yankees. Yes, 100%. And if they do not win, then things are not looking good and for them. Yeah, I'll, like I said, I said the Yankees in seven – if they win tonight. If they don't win tonight, the Astros are winning in five. I agree with you. So a little double prediction there, but I just, you know, that's just the way, like I said, momentum works weird ways. So I, I just think you cannot go against Verlander down two games. That's, Garrett Cole may be the best pitcher in the league right now. Justin Verlander is probably two or three. So you cannot, you know what I'm saying, it, it, it's going to be, it's going to be interesting there. Um, real quick, we're going to end this podcast, but Next Monday or Tuesday, we will be doing a World Series prediction. The World Series starts on Tuesday, no matter what, whether the series goes seven or it goes five. Uh, and if the winner of this, that series obviously will play the Washington Nationals. So we will be doing a World Series prediction on Monday or Tuesday morning. Um, and also, we will be doing an NBA season That's prediction. Right, baby. October 22nd, this, the NBA gets started. The same day as the World Series. So we have a very, very big day. So before that day... We will be doing another podcast, but for this podcast, we are finished. That the podcast right. today, Jared, is That's fun, right, man. of course. Uh, a lot. We had Jalen Ramsey and uh, the new 
LA Ram. We'll see if he plays this Sunday. He will only have a few days to get prepared, but he is an all-star caliber so player, and uh, he doesn't need a lot of time to adjust. So the Rams get a new star. Uh, the Angels get a new manager in Joe Madden, and we obviously have uh, the, the Nationals heading to the World Series in a big game for tonight with the Astros facing off in New York against October the Baseball, New York baby. A lot of interesting stuff can happen. For today's show, that is a wrap. Thank you for joining us. Uh, like Nick said, we will be back early next week for World Series predictions and NBA season predictions show. But for today, I'm Jared Smith. I'm Nick Dina. This has been the Cover 2 Podcast. Thanks for hanging with us, and we'll see you next week.